Hi, everyone. I'm Shruti Bharat from Allraise. Um, Allraise is a nonprofit that focuses on gender equity um, among founders and funders in tech. And I started, you know, after business school um, and I worked at a software company for five years. And I'm also a founder. Um, and Allraise is just an incredible ecosystem. Um, for underrepresented founders. And I th I've just learned a lot about um, women in VC and you know the fundraising process. So happy to share what I've learned and even at, from my founder perspective, like things about VC that I've, I've learned that may help you decide if this is right for you. Awesome. Uh, my name is Maria Pope. I am here on behalf of Black Girl Ventures, and we are also a nonprofit that works to support Black and Brown female identifying entrepreneurs um, all over the U.S. and the world. Um, and our signature event is the crowdfunded pitch competition. So if you think about like kick Kickstarter meets Shark Tank, um, you know, we're, we're empowering the community to be the investors um, and invest in the community and these amazing businesses. Um, and so it's been really beautiful to see, you know, just leveraging the power of community to support all of these women. And something that I really love in the way that we um, do it is that it's not just the top three winners that there is a cash prize for the top three winners, but then whatever those women individually crowd fundraise, they walk away with that money. So everybody walks away with something, um, whether that's, you know, a, a $10,000 cash prize or whether that's the the money that they fundraise from their own community, um, as well as obviously, you know, relationships with people in the ecosystem and things like that. But um, that's the main thing that we do. And then we also do um, community and capacity building through our online programming and other educational um, events that we put on. So that's Black Girl Ventures. Hey everyone, I'm Kristen from Expa. Um, I actually just joined Expo in March, so still relatively new to the venture world. I come from an operating world. Um, Expo was started about seven years ago by Garrett Camp, who's one of the co-founders of Uber. Um, he initially started it, just got some friends together, decided they wanted to start companies. So it was more of a studio venture model. Um, and over the past seven years, it's transitioned a little bit more to a traditional venture model. So now we have three different pillars. We still have the studio companies that are running. We have an accelerator program, which I'm heavily involved in. Um, we basically have between 250 and 400K in exchange for seven to 10% equity and a lot of hands-on support during a six to 12 month program. Um, and then our third pillar is just our seed, our seed ventures. Um, so that's anywhere between 250K up to 3 million. So that's a little bit about Expa. We are a sector agnostic. Um, they're like, the fund is, basically put together by builders like everyone else. Um, Vitor, who's our design partner, was the first Twitter designer. Um, so everyone was like very early stage, a lot of awesome companies, so really good building experience in the company. And then my own experience, um, 10 years of operating, I was just at Calm most recently doing a uh, sleep coaching program that they're kicking off. I was a director of product at Modsy, which is a 3D home design company. I was at Foursquare, I was in ad tech at Rocket Fuel and Bloom Energy, which is clean tech. So tons of different sectors, uh, mostly product growth and operations kind of experience that I'm bringing over now to the venture world. Amazing. Thank you so much for those introductions. I'm already just blown away by the diversity of knowledge and resources we have here. Um, as you can tell, like I alluded to at the beginning, just a great diversity of paths to get involved in fundraising. Um, and we're going to get further into that right now. Um, so some, some questions may actually speak a little more to you know one or two of the companies. So if you do feel like it's more in your area, feel free to just jump in and take over or add things as we go in. Um, but I'd like to start off by asking, what's the best route for someone with no experience in raising capital to go? Like what kind of are the first steps they should take? Uh, what questions should they be asking? Um, and really how can they just take it off with no experience? Um, I'm, well, I'm happy to start. Um, I am in that boat as someone who's new to this world and um, you know, didn't really know what it took um, to be that. 
I think the first thing is mainly your vision for your business. And if venture capital is important for you to achieve that vision, um, and that is really personal. Um, so I think the, the very first thing is like your own strategy, your five to 10 year vision and the real screening for venture capital fundraising. Um, and I'm sure the other, you know, Maria and Kristen will add on to this, but it's the way that I've heard it the most from VCs is like, will you be able to make a hundred million dollars in revenue some, you know, in 10 years or five to 10 years? Is your market going, are you going to be a billion dollar valuation? Is your market large? Um, and what I've often seen is because venture funding is the most visible, you know, it's like always in the news, it feels like that's the way to go, but it just isn't, you know, like there are, there are businesses that are called lifestyle businesses where, um, and I will give you an example. My first five years um, in my career were at a software company and it was owned by one person and he owned 51% by the end and it was acquired by a company and it was a $3 billion exit. And he owned 51%, which is really difficult if you go venture backed, right? And so it's funny because that kind of a business where you own it and maybe even you make a, a million, 2 million over time, those are considered lifestyle businesses, but you may actually end up owning all of it. Um, and so I think um, for me, the question is, is your business going to benefit greatly from a lot of cash and it will just turbocharge your growth and you think it can help you achieve that hundred million dollars in revenue, then, you know, venture funding is, is part of your strategy. Um, but really it starts with your own vision. I think that is a very valid point. I have a friend who started Andy swimwear, which is like a cool swimwear company based out of New York. And I just remember that was the, like the first thing she said to me, like, don't raise money until you absolutely have to, you start to get so much pressure and responsibility and you don't even always need it. So I think that's such a really good point to consider in your long-term strategy. Um, I do think, I mean, there are lots of routes to go when you're thinking about raising capital. Um, it feels like we have three, a couple of different ones here represented. Um, accelerators are one option that I can talk a little bit about. Um, I think plenty of people don't have like, you didn't go to that top tier school that everyone knows about, or you're not living in Silicon Valley and you don't have those connections and that's fine. And that's very normal. And I think that's what a lot of other like accelerators or yeah, accelerators can help you with. Um, so that's, Typically something that I'm helping focus on at Expa. Um, we have not, I'd say we've done some investing in women and underrepresented founders, but I want to do a lot more of it. So I think it's something that we are pushing a little bit more. Um, accelerators can help you kind of figure out what your story is, how to actually get to a good fundraise level. So once you're ready to raise your seed, um, you actually have hit the metrics, you have started to prove out that like you are the founder that can execute on this grander vision. So I think, yeah, that's one thing. I know accelerators, they have their pros and cons where they do take a little bit of equity into your company, um, but it just depends on the partner you're working with and if you think you're actually going to get a lot out of it. So that's just a, a little bit of a weight that you need to do, a little bit of pros and cons balancing for yourself. Uh, no, those are those are great thoughts, and I do love the diversity in, you know, the accelerator and all raise and block for ventures, and these are all very different ways to go about getting funding. And I love that we're talking about that. There's not run one right way. I think that's totally, you know, like a mindset shift that you need to make is like what's right for your business and where you are right now. Um, but I'll definitely take the crowdfunding or even the grants approach. Um, you know, for really early stage founders that are maybe raising capital for the first time. Um, I think obviously the capital portion of it is really important, but I think even more so it's building that confidence in your storytelling ability um, and getting all those thoughts and the traction you've made, you've had so far, um, you know, out in a deck. And like, if you haven't even made a deck yet, you know, doing, doing, applying for a grant or doing a pitch competition is a really great, like low barrier way to get um, capital. And it's also not quite as time intensive. 
Um, you know, so if you're raising for the first time, um, you know, you could spend a day or two pitching or writing a grant versus like committing to some month long, you know, monthly programming that's going to go for a while. Um, and that's, you know, a lot of what I've seen at Black Girl Ventures is that, you know, we're definitely like at the beginning of a founder's journey, right? So we're, we're not VC, um, but it's amazing to see women build that confidence in themselves and their ability to pitch and to realize that other people will pay for you to grow your business. You don't have to bootstrap. I think that's a, a really commonly misheld misconception, especially in the communities that we work in is like, you know, you have to do this all on your own and that's just not true. There are a lot of different resources out there. So um, I would say definitely like um, there's lots of great, amazing small business grants out there from a lot of different entrepreneurial support organizations. That's one great way. And then a pitch competition, whether it's, um, you know, we do ours is not equity, but there are equity crowdfunding, um, you know, organizations out there as well. And I would say either of those are, you know, a really great way to go. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for those amazing answers. And just to reiterate what you were saying just now, Maria, I love seeing the diversity and the different paths we're talking about here um, and kind of the different options. And this will help our founders really look at their business and figure out what suits them, you know, whether it's the stage of fundraising that they're in or what type of company, what type of industry they're in. Um, so thank you so much for that first question. And Given that we do have kind of like a diverse perspectives here in the room, I would love to hear the three of your opinions on, um, do you believe in ask for help and you'll get money or ask for money and you'll get help? Yeah, so we've interviewed a lot of um, successful Series A founders in the past few months. Um, the most successful founders have built relationships with investors way before they need to raise anything. And so that means, um, let's say you go through an accelerator like 500 startups or Expo or YC, and then, um, or even a smaller one, you end up sending you know, monthly or quarterly updates, you keep in touch, um, you ask for perspectives and advice, and then, the ideal state is actually, and I'm, I'm talking about venture, but the ideal state is like, you kind of know the investors that you like, and they kind of know what you're building so that you don't even have to do this like really intense pitch process, cold emailing. Like the ideal state is you kind of have your warm community out there and they're going to make the intros you need when you're ready. Um, so I think that's like, what I've heard is the most common mistake founders make is just waiting until the last minute or until you're like really low on cash um, to do all those relationship building activities. And, you know, now that you're in this ecosystem and you may want to fundraise, I think the relationship like networking is part of your job as a founder um, and it will make your life so much easier. So that's just some anecdotes from our series A founders like that is a very common theme. Uh, I can build on that. And I would definitely agree with the point of like putting yourself, like you have to think, you know, the long game strategy for fundraising, even if you're just starting out, like how could you start to build those relationships and what environments are you putting yourself in? Um, you know, accelerators is a great place to, you know, create a network, even clubhouse. Like there are lots of different ways to get these kind of like, you know, low um low barrier ways to like start building relationships with investors and you know so many amazing resources out there um that are connecting especially underrepresented founders now with you know incredible ecosystems um whether that's venture or even like different angel groups as well um and so i actually took the other approach when answering this question which was um you know i would say that in in my experience from what i've seen like it's really beneficial to ask for the money up front, um, because if they if they don't have the money, they could at least help you. But if they can't help you, they probably don't have money. <laughs> um, and so, just thinking about like um, you know, if someone, especially in the crowdfunding world that we operate in at Black Girl Ventures, you know, a lot of these folks aren't it aren't being angel investors, right? They're investing a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars um, into these companies. Uh, but the the great thing about and what I've seen be so powerful in all of these different um, you know, ecosystems that we're talking about 
is relationships. It's not just the financial capital, it's the social capital. And you need that social capital to complement um, those financial resources, right? Because it's great if you get a lot of money, but if you don't have the support to know what to do with that money um, and to, to create you know, a, a strategic way forward um, and how to multiply that money in your business, then um, it's not gonna be too much of a help. Yeah, and I, I just add, Maria, I totally agree. And I think, um, I think you always ask for money when you're actually fundraising and you're ready for it. And, but before that, that's when the relationship foundation is there. Um, so it's not like out of the blue. Definitely. When I saw this question, um, so yeah, ask for help and you'll get money or ask for money and you'll get help. To me, it seems like neither are necessarily true. Like ask for money and get money and then ask for help and you'll get help. Just I recommend being explicit in what you're looking for. Do not assume if you ask money, you will get help. That does not mean it's going to happen. Um, just make sure like the partners that you're choosing, if you are able to raise money, uh, look at their track record, look at how they've helped founders in the past, who have they given connections to, whether it's customers or potential other investors, um, have they actually given help on a product roadmap, if that's where you kind of need them to lean in. So I would just say, yeah, do a little bit of your own due diligence on them. Um, don't make any assumptions on the other side of the table. And one last thing to add to that, I think too, is, you know, just building on that strategy piece. Like when you're going into fundraising, you want to be super intentional because this is taking so much, you know, this is another job in itself, like as a founder that you're spending so much time doing this. Um, and so just doing all your due diligence, like, you know, you're not just casting a super wide net, you're going after like very targeted people that have the best chance of investing in what you have. Um, and so there's a lot of work on, you know, the front end of, of putting in that time and effort. But then, you know, as Shruti pointed out, hopefully by that point, when you're actually, you know, in the room asking for money, like you've already built those relationships over time and done all that front end work to make the process, you know, as smooth as possible once you're actually raising. Yeah. Yeah. And like the other thing I've noticed is founders often, you want to cultivate relationships with those who aren't going to invest in you too. Um, like friendly investors that are not in your space or other founders or advisors or, you know, operators and friends, um, because those are the folks that will give you the feedback you need for those, you know, for your target list. And those are higher priority, more important conversations. So I feel like before that, it's really about like building authentic relationships with people that can help you prepare for like the really high stakes conversations. Um, so yeah, I, I think like really successful fundraising process also relies on just a good network outside of investors. You know, it's like people who just are your support system. Thank you. That's such great advice for our founders. Um, thank you to the three speakers. And kind of going off of that point of, you know, help and money and kind of cultivating connections, but that leading you to money and the other way around. Um, I'm wondering, so besides the financial investment, you know, like the actual money itself, what does the partnership between founders and investors ideally involve? I'm still figuring it out again, because I'm relatively new, um, but I have seen it from the operating side. So I was in a bunch of the board meetings with my last company. So kind of saw what that was like with the investor on the other side of the table. I think one of the bigger ones that you can hope for is like personal support and motivation. Um, so that's at least what I'm hoping to be as an investor on this side of the table now. I think also depending upon the person or team that has invested in you, you have some of your, you have like typical investors who may honestly just be helpful with fundraising or kind of sharing insights that they're seeing across other industries. And then you also may have an investor that's more of an investor operator and that's a little bit more my angle. Um, so that can go beyond like to connections to potential customers, or if you need a new hire, who's like the head of platform engineering somewhere, like I can help connect you because of my own network over the past 10 years. Um, 
I think we, like the operator investors, we like to, we can actually provide more specific feedback. So when it comes to product roadmap or user research or like helping you formulate some of those things, because I've done them over the past several years, I can also lend a helping hand there. And then I think investors are good for just a little bit of accountability and pushing you. Um, you may kind of get lost in your deadlines and your timing, and you don't have that sense of urgency. So investors checking up on you every so often and kind of, especially if you're a team of one or a small team of two, um, it is good to kind of have that check in with them and kind of have them like keep pushing you toward the goals that you have probably already set for yourself and you just need a little nudging toward. Yeah, I can um, answer this one from a, maybe a different perspective, but you know, we don't, since we, all, we don't invest ourselves as an organization, um, I can't speak from that lens, but I would share that, um, you know, like Kristen mentioned, I think there's a lot to do with like the, the past, the financial things is like, they can be an advocate for you and their own, their own networks and also give you that expert advice and experience. And, you know, it's amazing to have so many VCs now have that operator experience coming in. Um, and that's super valuable to founders, um, to have someone that's done it before and is able to speak to that in a really different and specific manner. Um, the other, the only other thing I would add to that from, from our lens is that I think a lot of times it, it seems intimidating or, you know, the investor seems like you're the one asking for money and receiving from them, but to remember that it's like, they need you and you need them, right? Because in order for them to be successful, you need to be successful as well. Um, and so, you know, just, you know, you're on the same team, you know, once they've invested in you and, and you guys are, are on this journey together, like you're both headed towards that same goal. And so um, just remembering that, that, you know, like this is, this is a, a strategic partnership. And so in, in that realm as well, you know, want, you want to be values aligned because this is going to be someone that has decision-making power, you know, in your business um, and, and the direction that it's headed. So just also being aware of that through, you know, who, who do you partner with um, is also really important. Yeah, totally. I will definitely second all of that. I think what I have realized um, through All Rays is that you know, when you get an investor, you're getting a board member, you know, potentially you're getting an advisor, you're getting kind of a boss, uh, which like invest. And so all of these personal dynamics really matter. Um, so I think, you know, ideally an early stage investor can either introduce you to the next stage or they will themselves want to invest in the next stage. And so I think I've seen people, for example, in the early stages, like sometimes you take angel funding or something from anybody because you're like, I need to survive. But then down the line, you're like, oh, shoot, I actually don't really want you on my board or I didn't do diligence enough. And now you're causing problems for me. And so that really does happen down the line. So I do think like not all money is comes with the same strings attached. And so you want to know that this person is like aligned with your vision they're not going to make you, you know, grow in a way that you don't want to. Um, I think the other thing I will say is that VCs are constantly trying to figure out how to support their portfolio better uh, because that's also a differentiator for them. And like, they're trying to win, you know, they want, they want you also, just like Maria said, like, it's not always I'm the part. Literally, I'm literally creating a pitch deck for our accelerator right now. Doing exactly. exactly that. So just, to... yeah, like you're trying to attract <laughs> the best founders to pick you. <laughs> so I think um, in that sense, you take advantage of the communities that they're building, um, the ecosystem, um, any any kind of ask where you need some resources that are outside of your network. It's like, I need to hire a CTO. Um, I need an audit firm. I'm, I'm confused about this legal thing. Um, I wanna talk to one of your other founders about how they navigated this. Like those are all really important asks. So, um, you know, especially smaller emerging fund managers, angels, like I've often found they have more tactical advice. They're more likely to pick up the phone um, because they know who you are. So yeah, those are some thoughts on, uh, you know, just like thinking very carefully about the value add. Thank you, thank you. And I 100% agree with that. You know, money is 
money, but of course there are many things that come with it. One thing being the people behind it and all these other things to consider. Um, so this is such great advice for our founders and switching gears a little bit. I have a question more crowdfunding based um, for, for you, Maria and Black Adventures. Uh, and of course, anyone else, feel free to hop in. But I'm wondering why, kind of like, what is crowdfunding and why would someone choose to go the crowdfunding route instead of the traditional route? Yeah, no, that's that's a wonderful question. So um, yes, yeah, so crowdfunding in general. So we do um, crowdfunding that we do not take equity. So something like Republic or we fund or those different organizations, you know, they take equity in the businesses or there are investors in the businesses um, that have a vested stake in their success, you know, in the event of like um, a liquidation or, or, or um, them being acquired. Uh, we don't do that. So, you know, any money that the, that the women raise on our platform, Raiseify, they're able to, you know, invest into their business. But a reason to, to crowdfund potentially um, as I kind of mentioned earlier, I think it's a really great on-ramp to fundraising, uh, a really great way to build that experience and just pitching yourself, um, not only to potential investors, but potential customers, anyone in the community, you know, that's such a big part of what we do is just gaining exposure for our founders, um, and able to bring in, you know, our work is definitely could never, never be done alone, right? It's all in partnership with other organizations. And so just thinking recently, you know, we, we did a pitch competition with Nike and that was, you know, an incredible partner that, that just funneled a lot of, um, not just money, but resources like, you know, social capital into what we're doing. And the woman that actually won that pitch competition, now Nike is one of her customers, right? So um, I think there's a lot to do with like the type of crowdfunding that you go with. So, you know, we fund a Republic, those are definitely different. Um, but as far as the model that we have, uh, it's definitely the exposure I think is a really big pro and then obviously that there's no equity taken in your business so you're still able to have complete control um, you know over the future of your company and it's also a great way to start building that ecosystem and relationship um, and to invite people you know to put put yourself on the radar of those people that you want to invest in your company further down the line um, so those are definitely some pros to crowdfunding um, and I think you know, additionally, it's just, you know, this is, it's, I don't want to say a warm up because you are, you are, you're going to take home money, you know, if you do it well. Um, but I think it definitely mirrors the strategy eventually of going after like, you know, VCs or things like that in the sense that like, you have to be very strategic about the way that you build relationships, the way that you position yourself um, and how you orchestrate all those things to come together. Um, and so I think it can be a really great first step, um, and depending on your business too, right? You know, a lot of the VCs, a lot of VCs are looking for unicorns, right? And not every business is going to be a unicorn and that's totally okay. Like there's room, you know, there's room for main street just as much as there is for wall street and on all of those things come together, um, to form, you know, our economy and an, an, an ecosystem where, uh, you know, all those different businesses can thrive. So I would definitely say you know, really just to, to, it reminds me of what Shruti said earlier, but you really have to think like long-term, what's your vision? You know, if your vision is to have a brick and mortar in, you know, in your hometown, like maybe crowdfunding is a great option for you. Um, you know, if you, if you have something with a lot more intensive, like upfront cost, maybe it's not because you need some, you need bigger money to be able to upfront um, those costs to build a software product or something like that. Um, so those are some thoughts as to, you know, determining if crowdfunding is a great option for you. Thank you. Thank you for answering that. Um, I feel like I'm learning so much and this is really great, especially for kind of like you said, our more early stage founders and people assessing what position they are in before choosing how to fundraise and when to begin. Um, so, so switching back more onto the VC end, um, I'm wondering what trends have you been seeing when it comes to diversity in VC um, and what's going on kind of in the VC world currently? Um, I guess, do you mean in terms of like the market or um, how diverse founders are doing? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's kind of bleak out there. It's 
the the numbers are just not great um, in terms of the percentage of venture funding that goes to women, to people of color. Um, and, and it's mirrored in the venture ecosystem, you know, which is why Allraise exists, which is, um, you know, Kaufman Fellows did a study that said women are actually two times as likely, uh, more likely to invest in other women. Um, so I think that there is a lot of bias. What I found really interesting is like investors are not always they don't always uh, look at it as bias. So for example, sometimes um, the screening criteria that investors use, they're like, well, is this idea big enough? And then if you dig a little deeper, you find out like, okay, it seems like women end up pitching a little bit more realistic. They don't even, they don't lie as much about, they don't inflate their numbers as much. They're more um, true to like the, the reality and even underplaying the vision. And so that's like one bias I've heard pop up a lot. Um, there's a whole bunch of studies that show um, if you look at promotion and prevention questions. Um, so women founders get asked different types of questions um, while pitching. Um, and so you're, you're sort of justifying um, risks more than promoting the vision, um, which is something that male founders are asked more about. So yeah, I mean, I think the bias is out there. Um, I will say, I think what's really frustrating is hearing like how hot the market is right now and then not necessarily feeling it uh, where it's like, I think it sounds like there's a there's so much venture money out there, but I have not had traction or like I haven't met the right people. And so I, to that, I will just say like, you know, VC is very much on pattern matching. They look at historical data, historical returns to predict the future, which is dominated by white men. And so um, I think this, for anyone that isn't in that mold, it takes like more, uh, you, you have to really navigate people who will believe in you and like, um, understand what you're pitching, who, who, and there are a lot of investors I've spoken to who actually really like that women tend to actually have more traction by the time they get to a series B than men, for example. So, um, I think it's, I think it's about finding those investors that really value and want diversity. They talk about it. They've walked that talk. You look at their track record, they've done it. Um, it's tough to be the first, you know, it's tough to be the first woman in someone's portfolio. 66% um, of venture firms don't even have a woman. Um, so, so, you know, that's the, that's the landscape. And that just means that when you're navigating it, like it's really important to find real allies. Um, and that to me is based on like really looking at what they've invested in, in the past. Yeah, I honestly don't have much to add to that. I agree, like the stats have seemed dire lately. Um, and I am, like, I think there's definitely something to looking at what they've invested in in the past. And then also being open to the fact that they may have new people on their team willing to invest in new people in the future. So I think there are plenty of firms out there who have been hiring more diverse people recently who do want to focus on this. And I mean, if you look at their portfolio, maybe it's not that diverse, but they do want to start making this more of a focus. Um, so yeah, I mean, Expo is one of those, I think we're like, I want to make sure we're getting out there. We're seeing all of these awesome founders that don't historically have those kinds of networks. And we're like hearing these ideas and we're helping. Um, so, but yeah, everything else Trudy said is like absolutely spot on. Yeah. And like, Unfortunately, sometimes um, those male v VCs, um, they are very well connected. And if you have, I, I think sometimes it's like, you know, some brands can propel you in a way that like doesn't really make sense. It shouldn't be that way, but it's true. Um, so yeah, I think um, I do see, I do agree with Kristen because um, we'd work a lot with the investor community and I'm seeing a lot of interest from GPs, for example, and hiring the next generation of women, of underrepresented men. Um, I do think it's like, because the ecosystem is so connected, you know, more operators going into VC, um, more different types of backgrounds being valued. Um, that industry is changing. So for example, the number of check writers 
grew, um, that are women grew 2% last year. Um, amount of funding going to black women increased in 2020. So it's not all bleak. I mean, there's an upward trend and I think there are people like, you know, this community that are changing it. Right, definitely. Um, and, you know, it's definitely encouraging to see these amazing women, like the three of you in this industry. And it's been so great hearing from you today. Um, on that note, we'll wrap up the panel portion of this event and transition to our breakout rooms. But before we do that, I just wanna say a huge thank you for the three of you for such amazing information. Um, again, I have learned so much today and I would love to encourage our founders in the room to really engage in your breakout rooms. You know, this is your chance to ask questions. If you have, maybe if you are trying to get into VC and maybe if, even if you yourself are a woman trying to get into VC, I, I know Shruti is a great resource and crowdfunding, Black Girl Ventures, Accelerators, Expa. Um, so really get specific, you know, if you're looking for something or confused about something else, this is your time. And I'd like to ask all our founders when we get into the breakout rooms, if you could go around and give a quick introduction of yourself, um, what your company is, put your company, let us know. And then also for our speakers, uh, if you could let everyone know how they can get involved in the LA area with um, with Allraise or how anyone in the LA area can get involved with Black Girl Ventures or with Expa, um, as many of our founders are LA based. Yes. So we will. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to plug really quick there. We do have a free class on fundraising for seed and pre-seed founders. Um, so it's completely free. It's led by a lot of successful founders and investors. So I encourage you to enroll uh, because it's, it's, it talks a lot about like how to get started.